On Halloween night, 1977, America gathered around for a live TV event that shocked a nation. What happened was real. What you are about to see is the recently discovered master tape of what went to air that night. Hey there, movie buffs. Peter here from Vinyl and Celluloid, and yeah, I'm testing out some new stuff, especially with uh, more up-to-date reviews. I decided to start it with the latest horror title, Late Night with the Devil. I have to say, around this title, I was very excited. I think that in the last couple of years, we've really been treated to an impressive slate of horror movies. Uh, most of them were very good, some were even great. Others, especially those produced by the studio I Love to Hate, A24, not so much. Bullshit. Bullshit. Derivative. That I love. I absolutely love. I think 2024 is shaping up to be another great year with plenty of promising titles. On my watch list, we have Maxine, the third entry in Ty West horror homage saga. And I'm very curious about In a Violent Nature, the supposedly innovative ambient slasher that has the potential to make waves. One of the titles that was definitely on my radar and that kickstarted this year's horror cycle is the one covered in this episode, Late Night with the Devil. The movie premiered at this year's edition of South by Southwest and was immediately praised by critics. The promotional material, <laughs> which included both a poster that is a dead ringer for a Kenny Nolan album and a personal endorsement by none other than Stephen King himself, were followed by an extremely effective trailer that ensured the movie was on everyone's radar. The title opened on Friday, 22nd of March, in selected markets and scared audiences into decent business, generating over $2.8 million over the opening weekend and, eerily enough, generating $666,666 on Sunday, the 24th of March. A marketing ploy resulting from creative Hollywood accounting or just a weird coincidence? I'll let you be the judge of that. Find out from the inside if the books are cooked. Currently, the movie has a 97% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 3.6 average score on Letterboxd. But the question remains, is Late Night with the Devil that good? Advertised as a crossover between The Exorcist and Network, the movie follows Jack Delroy, played by David Dasmalkin, a late-night talk show host at the fictional fourth broadcaster UBC. For six years, between 1971 and 1977, Delroy has lived in the shadow of Mr. Late Night himself, real-life NBC Tonight Show host Johnny Carson. After a set of tragic life events and poor ratings, leave the future of his show uncertain and pending cancellation a soon-to-be grim reality, Jack and the show's producer, Leo Fisk, played by Josh Quantart, conjure up an insane guest lineup for Halloween night, aiming to boost the show's ratings during Sweeps Week. Guests include potential charlatan psychic Chris Tu, former magician turned skeptical Carmichael the Conjurer, and author and parapsychologist Dr. June Ross Mitchell, who has adopted and has been treating Lily, a child who is possessed by a demon. During the show's broadcast, strange events take place. The broadcast reaches its scariest zenith once the third guest, June, arrives with Lily, culminating with a real-life possession of Lily, which unleashes chaos unlike ever before seen on live television. Okay, let me start by saying that overall the movie fails to meet its potential, and I really don't get all the praise the movie has been getting. As a high concept title with an interesting premise, the execution results in a really deflated production that tries to be too many things and falls short on multiple fronts. I think Late Night with the Devil contains the building blocks found in diverse genres such as found footage, demonic possessions, faux documentaries, I'm thinking of the likes of Ghostwatch, and the social commentary based horror entries like Jordan Peele's movies. But their lack of commitment results in a below par entry, though one that's well paced and even economical. After all, the movie's like 93 minutes. And speaking of time, after enduring roughly two minutes of studio logos in what can only remind us of that old Family Guy sketch. You can never figure out when the hell the studio logos end and the actual movie begins. Alright, let's see what you got, Fox. Oh, I bet that's a sea monster. Oh, that's not the movie. That's. Yeah, I think I heard of them. 
the movie kicks into gears with a decent amount of exposition, courtesy of none other than cult icon Michael Ironside. And I think this is where things really go off the rails, right? Um, the sequence just gives away too much, including the minor plot twist. And mind you that it's so minor that I'm even reluctant to use the term plot twist. I think it also sets the visual code for the whole movie, which unfortunately is very uneven. On one hand, we are treated to an analog broadcast of the infamous episode of Delroy's show, Night Owls, with cuts of pristine like 4K black and white footage of what happened when the cameras weren't rolling. I think if you're going to keep the ruse going, at least make sure that there isn't such a visual disconnect. I would say, on the bright side, that the creative team behind this title didn't commit the same cardinal sin as 2018's lost movie, air quotes, Antrim, which featured appalling digital aging and post-production imperfections. I think on the bright side, we have good acting that counteracts the mediocre visual vibe. Uh, that Malkian's Jack Delroy is simply fantastic. Um, I think it really channels the nervousness and the stiff demeanor and that show must go on ethos that we still find in today's late night shows. He's no Howard Beale, mind you, but as a man hungry for success, he's damned convincing. He also brings an aura of relatability, and I think that was really needed if this movie was gonna succeed, because we the audience are no strangers to painfully and funny demonic forces lurking in late night TV time slots. I think Ingrid Terrell as Lily is almost as scary and disturbing as Linda Blair, but some of the angles used in the movie could really be better explored to convey a scarier act. On the supporting front, Ian Bliss is very good as a curmudgeon Carmichael, offering some decent entertainment, and Laura Gordon's June Ross Mitchell is compelling. Her character is almost a composite between two of the Exorcist franchise's leading characters. On one hand, you have hints of Ellen Burstyn's Chris McNeil from The Exorcist, and on the other, Louise Fletcher's Jean Tuscan from Exorcist II, The Heretic. Of course, this is all mixed with a twisted moral compass, giving us a somewhat original character. Okay, so now you're entering the spoiler-filled section of this review. If you haven't seen the movie, I suggest you move to the final portion of this video. So like I said before, for a movie with such an interesting premise, uh, Late Night with the Devil tries too hard to avoid the horror genre tropes and cliches. And whilst it partially succeeds, it also avoids to use some of the elements that would really have enhanced the viewing experience. The absence of jump scares and subliminal imagery really hurt the movie. There's tension, but nothing shocking. Also, for a movie that has set the goal of being original, it ends up being derivative as hell. Yeah, the ghost watch and network inspiration is obvious, but the possession sequences and makeup are borderline ripoff of William Friedkin's 1973 classic. And then we have the visual effects, right? <laughs> Where to start? I think some of it comes like directly from Wes Craven's Shocker, such like the sequences where Mr. Riggles manifests itself through electricity, and then you get the Village of the Damned, John Carpenter's edition, of course, when the demon breaks free from Lily's body. Uh, none of it is good. Um, also, you add to uh, this everything I already mentioned about the splits between the actual broadcast and the behind-the-scenes sequences and the disconnect between the two visual tones, and you have a horror movie that doesn't honor the greatness of the visual medium. Now, I have absolutely no issues with the use of AI to create images that are on screen for just a few seconds. If anything, the fake-looking imagery shows how limited AI still is, and I think the outrage from the pearl-clutching zealots who probably use ChatGPT to understand how one uses a toothbrush is nothing short of ridiculous. And it's funny how this movie is really dividing audiences. On one hand, you have people who praise this as a glorious horror movie, which it clearly isn't. I would really like to know what kind of movie they watched, because how can you praise the visuals on something so mediocre? And on the other hand, you have people who are rejecting the movie without even seeing a single frame because it uses AI. Um, it's, it's just funny, I think both groups are wrong, you certainly should watch the movie, uh, don't have high expectations, but yeah, you shouldn't just trash something just because there's a minor usage of AI. But yeah, the unspecial effects present throughout the movie don't hold the candle to the terrible third act and ending. I mean, wow. Um, 
where to start. In a sequence that's reminiscent of 1976 Carrie, we see three key characters being offed in the least dramatic way possible. <sighs> if De Palma was able to deliver an iconic climax with mid-1970s technology and effects, Colin Kearns and Cameron Kearns had the duty, the obligation, to simply do better. Also, the final reveal where Jack, who was part of this secret society, is shown to unwillingly trade his wife's life for success is already spelled out in the opening narration. So if the directors had kept this information a secret from us uh, and used a slow build-up for the reveal, or at least shown Lily's involvement as, um, I don't know, a direct victim of the society, I think that would have been more impactful. Imagine if Lily had actually been present in um, Jack's sessions, that would be amazing. Um, I also found the sequences involving the cancer-ridden Madeline Delroy extremely uncomfortable for personal reasons and completely unnecessary. Also, the final sequence with Jack reliving moments of his show was lazy and out of place. Now, I'm no screenwriter, but I've seen plenty of movies, and that qualifies me to pitch a better ending, so here it goes. I think a better ending would have actually found Jack finally being number one in the ratings, and a hero for defeating the devil, or a demon. I think then he would have been approached to take on Johnny Carson's role on The Tonight Show, an offer that would require an additional unnamed sacrifice. Jack would stare at the contract, holding a pen, and the camera would cut to black, leaving the audience wondering if Jack hadn't learned his lesson and if there was nothing he would not sacrifice for personal success. As I told you, I really wanted to like this movie. I had high hopes and since I watched the trailer for the first time, I was really excited and yeah, thought this would be a future classic in the making. Also, the fact that I really enjoyed The Exorcist and Network is my favorite movie. Um, I thought finally uh, a great horror movie that brings both together. That said, I just couldn't like the movie. Putting it simply, Late Night with the Devil is just a case of much ado about nothing. It's an okay movie that cannot live up to the hype, largely due to the execution. I think after the initial unjustified praise, the movie will only be remembered because of its minor AI controversy. It may last only 93 minutes, but it took me only 2 minutes to forget about most of what I saw. A missed opportunity, if there ever was one. Thank you.